Well, good morning and welcome uh, to Southside Bible Church. If you're visiting, grateful to have you here with us and just grateful for the regular attenders, the body of Christ. Today is a very special Lord's Day because we, we corporately remember the Lord's table. And so we are going to slow down and look again at our blessed hope, uh, dying in our place to redeem a bride for himself. And then we're studying the behaviors then that flow from such a reality of love and submission and compassion, harmony and humility. And in particular, right now, we're looking at how it flows into marriages. And that's the current section we're studying. And so if you'll turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, last week we looked at verses 1 through 6, and this morning we'll land in verse 7. You husbands in the same way, Live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. And so usually on Communion Sunday, we, I like to seek a passage that will stir up our minds and our hearts by way of remembrance at the table. But since we did look last week at the role of wives, uh, I didn't want to take another week before we looked at husbands. It just didn't seem Right, although some of the men have come down with a cold this morning and missed, uh, it, it would serve them right to skip it and then do it next week when they come back. Uh, but what God has joined together, let no man separate. So we're going to look at husbands and wives back to back. So shall we pray that, that God will meet us in power and change and transform the husbands in this church and the future husbands and the, the young children, praying that you will grow up to be these kind of men. That every husband would leave this morning with a deeper and stronger commitment to living with his wife in an understanding way. I pray that every young man would seek, seek to grow in Christ uh, to one day live this way with your bride. Uh, the ancient words led them in part uh, to you this morning. And I pray that every young lady would learn well what to look for and a husband. I, I pray that it will never be about someone's body and their IQ or their eyes or their earning power. I, I pray that you would see this morning what you should look for uh, in a man. I, I pray that you would look for a man after God's own heart, and that's what we'll see in this passage before us. And lastly, if any of you have come here this morning and you've never been born again, maybe you're just religious and you haven't been born again by this power that we've been studying in First Peter, I, I pray that you would see such a beautiful design that God has made for marriage that it would lead you to, to what marriage is picturing. Marriage is a type, and it's pointing to something greater of its reality of the way Christ loves His bride. And I pray that you would leave this morning married to Jesus Christ and a covenant that would keep you one with Him for all of eternity. And so let's go to... God and ask Him then to meet us here in the Word of God. Father, we come before You, and uh, I pray that we don't take that for granted. I pray that we realize why we can come and draw near to You this morning. It came at great cost and great sacrifice. God, we will remember this morning that sacrifice. And I pray that every heart is full, that this sacrifice now we do draw near to You with confidence and a sincere faith. God, I thank you that we dwell with you now as children of God. I pray this morning as we open these words that you would meet us in a powerful way. God, I pray that your spirit would make these kind of men. I pray for every married man here this morning, God, that your spirit would work within their hearts. I pray for the young men of this church, Father. I love them so deeply, and I pray that you will be preparing and equipping them to be these kind of men. We love our little ones, Lord, these children who bring so much joy and delight into this church. I pray they, they feel just how loved they are by this whole body. And I pray that even the, the little boys this morning, God, that you would begin giving them a picture of what to grow and, and what they should be looking and seeking to become even now. So, Lord, move in power in, in the midst of your congregation this morning. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, just a, a brief context is we're learning in Peter, how do we live as aliens 
uh, in a society that stands against what we hold dearly. We're so countercultural to everything called the world. So how do we come now and live in the midst of them and, and, and seek to win them to Jesus Christ? And in 1 Peter 2.12 2, was the foundation of our section where Peter said we're to glorify, we're to live lives of excellent behavior so in the day of their visitation, which is salvation, they would give glory to God because of the way you lived your life before them. And then the answer is, what kind of lives should we live then? And Peter said, one of submission, one of submission to God and His established authorities that He has created. And their governmental authorities was the first section. Then we looked at bosses to our masters, our, uh, we're, how, how employees are to submit to their bosses. And last week, Peter now moved it into the home, and he gave instruction for the wife. And how is she to respond to the authority of a husband who's being disobedient to the Word of God? And we saw the submission that she's to bring and the beautiful outworking of her character and her inner beauty before this man. Submission. Win them by your excellent behavior. John Piper summarized last week's section this way. He said, wives aim to magnify God's superior worth by hoping in him above her husband, to have hope in God above your husband, and by showing to him a life that is more husband honoring than if he were an idol. It's going to be more honoring that God is my God and I hope in him above you. Your behavior will be more husband honoring if you will put him in his rightful place. This morning, we're going to move on to Peter's admonition now to husbands. Because if a woman submits to a man the way that God has called her to, the husband has a huge responsibility then that has been laid upon him, one that can truly be misused and abused. And it has been since the fall. Since the very fall when Adam said, God, it's the woman that you gave to me, he immediately began, he, he transfers and starts blaming her and blaming God. And so ever since the fall, there has been a danger in this structure and the fallenness of humanity. And so husbands, how do I live in this society, in my marriage, that will show this world the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ? How am I going to live in such a way that the world will look by the way I treat my wife and say, I need that God. I see the gospel in that. Tell me what is the hope within you. And so that's what we're driving at, not just to be good husbands, but to live in an excellent way so that the world will look and see and get a picture of the way Christ loves his bride and the way the bride loves Christ. This is bigger than just my marriage. This is the glory of God by the way I treat my wife. And so what I would like to do as we begin this morning is I want to give you an outline of our text here in verse 7. Uh, it's really a map for how we're going to seek to understand this verse better this morning. <clears throat> so I see two exhortations in verse 7 to husbands. Your exhortation is to dwell with your wife in an understanding way. And the second exhortation is you are to give her honor. And then Peter gives two reasons for these uh, exhortations. Here are the reasons for each one. So he says, dwell in an understanding way. The reason she's a weaker vessel. And the second one is give her honor because she's a joint heir with you. And then he's going to close the, 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 this, this verse with the capstone, probably the, the capstone of motivation to a husband is he says, so that your prayers will not be hindered. And so that's how we'll journey this morning. But before we look at these exhortations, I just want you to look with me in verse 7 uh, and consider who is this exhortation given to. Uh, verse 7, you husbands, you husbands in the same way. And it takes us back then to our larger context, so we can't miss that. That we're to glorify God as aliens by submission to authorities. And we're to look at now the other side of marriage. Paul, Peter's going to address the ones then who are in authority. How are you in authority then to treat your wife in submission to God? Christian husbands then is who he's addressing. This is for Christians. And this is men then who have experienced 1 Peter chapter 1 through 2. This is those who have been born again to a living hope. 
who have an inheritance undefiled and imperishable and will not fade away. Those who are protected by the power of God, those who have been joined as living stones into this temple that God is now building in this new covenant. So you have been born again. This is Christian men that are being addressed. And so you are those who, though you do not see Christ, you love this Christ. And this now is what then is to flow out of your great salvation, the salvation that ang- angels have an epithumia. They're longing and looking into this salvation. It's so beautiful. They want to know it. They want to learn more of it. And you are a possessor of it. So what reality should come out of one who possesses eternal life through Jesus Christ? How Christian husbands should you treat your wife? This is to men who have a grace then enabling them to obey this God-given exhortation. This is not uh, your own strength, your own empowerment. No man can do this. This is the grace of God that you have, believer in Jesus Christ, to live this way. You're a man who have a new heart that wants to be pleasing to God from the core of your being. Just show me, Lord, what you want from me. I am yours, you are mine. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And so I, play, I pray that no man would run from the standard this morning. You would not run from the standard, but that you would run to God who gave the standard and the grace to be these kind of men. He died so that you might die to sin and live to righteousness, and now he's going to define some of that righteousness, husbands, and how you love your wives. And so I would ask this morning, don't let past failure or weakness or difficulty keep you from a God who wants to empower you to put him on display in this world so that many would get saved by the way that you love your wives. This is the will of God. May this morning be an empowering turning point in your life, not sending you into despair and quitting. I pray that you would look at this with the eyes of faith and the empowerment of God to live this out. Uh, Your past failures have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Don't live in them. And I want you this morning to look to this cross and look to Jesus Christ and look at this standard and know that there is an enabling grace to be these kind of men. This is what I've prayed for myself and for the men of this church. My prayer is that in three months, I want to hear from every wife My husband has never been so understanding and giving me so much honor than I've ever had. I want to hear that from every wife. Are you with me, men? So let's begin and look at our first exhortation. If you'll look then in verse 7. You husbands, in the same way, (coughs) live with your wives in an understanding way. The Greek word for live, it it means really to just dwell together with. Peter uses so many words here in this epistle that are used nowhere else in all of the New Testament. And here is another one of those words. And it's it's a word, two words. It's the word for house and a prefix that means together. So to house together, to to be living together. The the, the command in Genesis 2, leave father and mother and cleave to your wife. Now, this is you leave and you become one, this new unit, this marriage, this bond. You dwell together now. You live as one. And now he's saying those then who are married, who live together, you better live and house together in an understanding way. In a, according to knowledge would be a literal translation. The Greek word for knowledge here is the word gnosis, gnosis. And it carries the idea of kind of an experiential knowledge, very intimate. I've shared it before that uh, Mary, Joseph never knew Mary and she conceived a child. Same word. And so live with your wife and this intimate knowledge that's been gained through experiential knowledge. And the question is the knowledge of, of what? Peter doesn't all the way tell us. I've been reading commentators and books on marriages and preachers, and they have just gone all over the board on this one, what it will look like. And most of what they say is very good stuff. It's very helpful, and it's all biblical. But I like the way the the New American Standard translates it, understanding way. 
So they're, they're, they're kind of, that's a, a translation. I, I want you to live with gnosis, with an understanding knowledge of, the, of a way. I don't know about you, but that leaves me just a little bit in the dark. Does that solve it for you men? I, I want to live with my wife with gnosis then. I want to live with knowledge. I want to live in an understanding way. So Peter, help me because I desire this as a born-again child. I want to know this. And so here's my general answer. What does it mean? Well, I believe it's a regular study then of God's Word to have gnosis. And so I need to learn this Word of God. I need to learn about God and man and salvation and sanctification. I need to learn about God's design of marriage. I I need to learn 1 Peter 1 through 2. I've got to master those things and know them and turn them around and understand them from all angles. I need gnosis, so a regular study of God's Word, men. And secondly, I need a regular study of my wife. I need to know how she thinks. I need to know what are her spiritual gifts, her weaknesses, her strengths, how she responds to different approaches of my leadership the way that she receives love. I need to be understanding and learn my wife. I know a lot of men who like to learn the Bible but don't want to learn their wife. And this word is calling both of them together. I study both. And that is the key if you're going to live with your wife in an understanding way. And I'll add this, it's a present tense participle. And it's got an imperatival force which means you're being commanded to keep always doing this, living with your wife in an understanding way, not just when she made you a good dinner or you had a good day. This is your characteristic way of life. I don't coast in the way I care for her. I don't get static. I am growing in my knowledge of the Word of God and my wife so that I can live with her in an understanding way. And I pray that my best days and loving my dear bride are ahead And I pray that my best days are not when I courted her and I put on my very best. I pray this is a call that my best days are today and in the future toward loving this woman and living with an understanding way. And unfortunately, men, Peter's going to drill just a little bit deeper uh, to help us understand then what does that mean by knowledge. And the reason he gives is he says, Uh, live with them in an understanding way as with someone weaker since she is a woman. Since she is a woman. So I'd like you to say a little prayer for Pastor Ken right now that he doesn't (laughs) get himself into too much trouble. Sometimes I uh, just like to speak sometimes without thinking. Uh, So I think we're running out of time. Let's go to the table. (laughs) Some of you ladies might need the communion table at the end. It's about forgiveness. But I want to give you just a little translation of what that is. Uh, it's, It's really, live with your wife in an understanding way as unto the weaker vessel, the feminine one. Live with your wife in an understanding way as unto a weaker vessel, the feminine one. There's a beauty to this phrase here. And so, guys, this is a call to husbands to have this knowledge in an understanding way with who your wife is as a created identity that is a weaker, weaker vessel in her femininity. And I see more guys who are mad because their wife is not acting more like a man. I have men who say, you know, she's just so emotional about everything. She doesn't even mow the grass. She doesn't like hunting. Uh, my teasing and rough humor hurt her where all the guys at work think it's funny, and you're always bothered that your wife isn't a man, and that's why you married her, because she isn't. (laughs) She's a woman. Peter made it very clear. She's a woman, and it just kind of brings you right back to Genesis 2, where I love that God gives this purpose for marriage that you, um, uh, in Genesis 2, 18, that I'm going to make you a helper, Adam suitable for you. And then he, he has this little section in there naming the animals. And whatever animal comes by, Adam gives it, and that's its name. And then he comes back right after that and says, for this purpose, the man shall leave his father and mother 
shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And I've always asked, it seems weird, there's, here's this purpose of marriage, here's this purpose of marriage, and there's these naming animals right in the middle of it. It's like, did, did Moses get lost or something? And I really think that what's going on is you're not lonely in paradise with God. And now all of a sudden, if you remember the animals, they, they come by in twos. And as they come by, whatever he names them, he names them. And when Adam finishes, he's like, where's my animal? Nothing fits me. Nothing's like me. Nothing's according to me. And so God puts a deep sleep upon Adam, and he takes his rib, and he wakes him up, and he, he brings to him woman. And I always joke and say the first Hebrew word was waka waka. <laughs> waka waka. And he looks, and, he, and he, this is what a woman does to a man. He breaks out into the first uh, country song that was ever written. <laughs> and he says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called Isha because she was taken out of Ish. She shall be called woman because she was taken from man. And there's just this beauty of what God has done, and then he gives the purpose of marriage. So let's look at this. Woman, that was brought to Adam. This is important to living then with your wife in an understanding way. And so Peter says she's a weaker vessel. And I, I want you to notice first, uh, uh, men, that this implies that uh, you're weak. <laughs> Just catch that word right away is she's weaker, okay? Uh, you got weak and you got weaker in this passage so I think right away, just don't forget that you're created ones. You're, you're, uh, God is the creator, and you're the created ones. Uh, don't get puffed up. Uh, this is comparative. And compared to Adam now, Eve was made weaker. And so the question is, how is she weaker? And we know throughout Scripture and even through life that she's not morally weaker in any way. Uh, Paul's going to say she's not spiritually weaker. Weaker. Peter, Peter will say that later in this verse. She's not intellectually weaker in any way. Uh, last week, the courage that we saw with Sarah, she's not weaker in courage. And so, what is it? Uh, uh, it's a created identity that is now saying it's a weaker vessel. And so, like an idiot, I'm going to try to answer that in three ways. <coughs> I think the answer is beautiful and important, though, is why I'm going to labor for men to help us live this way. First, I think it's physically. I think biologically, by design, God made it that she would be weaker. I'm watching the Olympics, and have you ever noticed in the Olympics that it's never man against woman competing? I, I just read an article in Florida, there's a transgender who won the wrestling match and so it, it was, you know, a guy wrestling against girls or something, and this is whole debate. And so what I want you to see is God made them biologically, by design, weaker. So why do men and women not compete against each other? Why not against each other? Why are all the records faster and stronger for the men? And, and just a side note that in the Olympics, there's probably not one woman who couldn't beat me in every one of them. So... It, <laughs> I want you to get what's going on here. Is it's, there's a design here. It's a creational design, and there's a good reason for this. Adam was created with a greater strength, and Adam loved what he saw in Eve, and Eve loved what she saw in Adam, and he wanted to take all that God gave to him, a difference in a strength to protect and care for his sweet wife not to abuse and belittle and control and manhandle. That is not why God made him stronger. This beautiful by design is God's design. Ladies and men, please hear that. This is God's design, and sin has made a mess of this design. Women who cry, I can do anything now better than a man, and I will give my life to prove it. I will not let man have this strength over me and I will fight it the rest of my days. That will be my life mission instead of the glory of God. You are missing your beautiful femininity that God has designed for you women if you spend all of your days trying to be a man. Wanting to outdo them in strength and just embrace your beautiful femininity that God has made for you. Embrace it. Men, 
live with understanding in this area, a superior strength for her protection. With great strength comes great responsibility. I think that's from Spider-Man. <laughs> Second is emotional weakness. And I, I wouldn't die all the way on this hill, uh, but I know many women who, who can be stronger in certain emotional issues. If, if I get a cold in my house and my wife gets a, the, the flu, she still cooks, cleans, takes care of all the kids, and I lay there for a week like the world came to an end. So I know that there are issues here. But what I mean by this, for the most part, is there's a greater emotional sensitivity that God has put within a woman, and it's, it's her beauty. And there is that. It's, uh, I've t- I think I've shared this with you before, but my son, Joshua, uh, probably would have died if he just had a, a dad. And one day he had a stomach ache so bad, and Laura's like, something's wrong. And th- there's a sensitivity and a compassion that she spotted, and I'm like, I'll just, you know, give him a little something to drink, Sprite or 7-Up, and he'll be fine. And it turned out his appendix was about to burst. And mom's sensitivity and all, all of our life together, there is a tenderness that my wife has emotionally that, that is beautiful to watch a mom with her kids. And so this is something beautiful about how God has designed a woman. And that's my point is after 27 years of counseling marriages... I find that wives are more likely to be hurt by conflict within a marriage by the inconsiderate behavior on the part of a husband. So when a marriage is struggling, I'll find that it's most often it hurts the wife even deeper, and she's mostly 99% of the time the one who initiates counseling because she wants it fixed. Where the guy is most often, what's the problem? I work hard, I provide a nice house and a car for you, what more do you want? I mean, could you picture a woman wanting anything more than that? (laughs) So this, guys, would be important in understanding a weaker vessel, to care about her tenderness and her emotions and her needs to vent and all of those things. So there's a a physical, and there's an emotional. And thirdly, I think this might be what Peter's getting at probably the most in this passage, is there's a positional weakness. Uh, What we're seeing in our passage in in 1 Peter is there's an authority in marriage that calls for male headship designed by God. And this puts a woman in a great vulnerability. It puts her in in a weakness. Submission is the weaker position. And so there's a difficulty here. This is not to be demeaning in any way. A husband is to live with knowledge and understanding of this authority that he has over a wife. It's a weaker position. And this is not to ever be abused, controlled, manipulated, selfish ends, to be a predator, to take advantage, or machoism. It's to have understanding of the role that your wife then is in in this marriage. And it's to use this authority the way that Christ used his ultimate perfect authority for his bride. And the way Christ used his authority is he laid his life down and he died on a cross for his bride. And he lives for her and he makes intercession for her and he has given himself to her. And I can't tell you the vulnerable place that this puts a woman in in the weaker place. And husbands, you better live with it in an understanding way is what Peter is saying as those who are going to give an account to God for how you live with your wife in an understanding way in this design. And none of this misuse or abuse in this area goes unnoticed by God. It is, it is seen by God and you will give an account to God. It matters, men, that we live with our wives in an understanding way in this idea of headship and one in submission. He cares about you living in an understanding way with your wife. And so I want you to get this. Eve is not threatened by Adam's superior strength and role. Adam is stronger to use it to love and protect and subdue the earth in caring for Isha, woman, husbands, love, Nurture, protect from the way that God has designed you. 
He's made you to be able to do that, to be a gentleman and kind and compassionate and doors and groceries, protection from a man. Use the areas that you are stronger or less weak, I should say, to serve these brides that God has given to you. And I've met, <laughs> I've not met many who, women, who do not flower like a rose when a man is like this. It can happen, but for the most part, I just watch a woman flourish with a man who will live in an understanding way like this. And so the question, men, is your wife wilting under your headship? I, I've seen girls just glowing and radiating and serving the body of Christ, and they get married, and they just start to wilt, and they wilt, and they wilt, and they have no service in the body of Christ, and they just start to die under your godly headship. Is she flowering? Are her gifts for the kingdom of God and for the family flowering? Or are you just using your position and strength to control her for your own ends? And that needs to be answered with judgment day honesty. Am I using this role to just get what I want? You will stand before God, and He's the one who says, I know your deeds. And so I pray that every man in here would look at your own heart and say, how am I using the authority that God gave to me to the weaker one uh, in this role of submission? And am I using it the way Christ is using it for his bride and taking that superior strength or whatever he's given to you in all these areas to come and to nurture and love and live with your wife in an understanding way? I've watched too many men abuse this and think, I'm King Tut, and now everyone is going to come and serve me. And you've missed the whole gospel if that's how you view your headship. Christ viewed his headship in such a way that he emptied himself and took on the bondservant of a man, becoming obedient to death even on a cross. There's our example, men. One of the burdens of my soul is our culture. And it has thrown off male and female. And females are becoming more and more male. And they're preaching to you to become like a man. Don't be squashed. And males are becoming more and more female. And they can't lead anymore and they've become wimps. And they, they just, I don't know even what it means to be a man anymore. And now they, they don't know whether they like boys or girls. I've been talking to high school teachers and saying most of them don't even know if they like boys or girls. And now, as of late, they don't even know if they are a boy or a girl. Marriages are failing. And one of the reasons, not the only one, is this. God's design has been rejected in this world. The beauty that God has designed is being rejected. And he says, do not be conformed to this world. How many women have you been conformed to this world in your thinking? And men, are you being conformed and thinking like this world? Or is the word of God renewing your mind to the beauty of how God made a male and a female to dwell together in a covenant relationship to show the way Christ loves his bride? Are you being conformed or transformed by the word of God? The church has become afraid to stand and preach God's truth and this design of male and female and head and submission, men being men and women being women, the way that God designed them to function and the way that he designed them to be. Do you need to repent this morning? Do you need some counsel? Do you want a mentor? Older women teaching younger women how to be women and some older men teaching the younger men how to be men. Do you need mentors? I want you to seek me out. I've got plenty of them for you. Have you been more conformed to this world maybe than you care to realize or admit? Isn't God's standard right and perfect? Repent if you have any other thinking about this because it's come from the world and it needs to be repented of. May God raise up men and women to glorify Him with his beautiful creation and his plan for marriage, for the salvation of those who have it all wrong. So that they'll, the world will look on and, and they'll glorify God one day and the day of visitation because of what they saw 
in your marriage. I praise God for the recent marriages at the church and the engaged couples who are putting this on display and they're being blessed greatly in the design of God's design in marriage. Well done. Uh, I love you. Keep pursuing uh, in these marriages that way. All right, that's all for free. <laughs> Maybe just one more thing for free. Dads, teach your kids this by how you treat your wife. Kids, you will teach your, dads, you will teach your kids this, how to live with your wife in an understanding way, not by the books, but by watching you day in and day out how you treat that bride. I'll, I'll teach my boys more about living with their wife in an understanding way by living with me day to day, seeing the way I treat my wife. And brothers, how you treat your sisters is how you're going to treat your wives. If you can't respect your own sister and your own family or your sisters in the body of Christ, you're not going to get this right. In your own homes, quit fighting, siblings. Where are you all at? Raise your hands. Do not treat each other that way because God wants you to love one another. And then moms, teach your kids, please, to embrace and love the beauty of femininity by the way you treat your husband. They're going to watch that. And I promise you this, your kids will not learn this from our society. They'll learn it in their homes and they'll learn it in the church. And I pray that we would do that, that we would raise up disciples who would be these kind of men and women. All right, that's my first point. <clears throat> so that's our first exhortation to live in an understanding way. And I got to get moving. The second exhortation then, show her honor. <clears throat> give honor. It means to pay out, to show, to demonstrate. Peter used it in verse 7, that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is a call to assign or show or pay honor to your wife. To regard someone or something as of great value. Why don't you go ask your kids, kids, do you see your mama as great value by the way I treat her? Or does it make you want to disrespect her as, as well and talk back because of the way I treat her? To regard someone or something of great value and treat it accordingly by word and by deed of this recognition. Why? Because she's a fellow heir of the grace of life. And all the commentators I could read are saying this is the salvation of ultimate salvation when Jesus returns for his bride. Do you realize Jesus is going to come back and your wife is going to inherit the earth? She's a fellow heir. It was used in 1 Peter 1, 4 that you have this inheritance reserved in heaven. So here it is, this inheritance that's coming at the end when Jesus returns. And so wives are fellow inheritors of the grace of life. They have spiritual and eternal life equally, equally. And so get the argument of Peter. By creation, she's a weaker vessel. And by recreation, she's a fellow heir with you of grace. Do not miss that. Show honor to your wife. Value. Give weightiness to who she is. Do you realize when you wake up in the morning... The woman lying next to you is going to be a queen of heaven. Give honor to your wife. I'm going to give a quick illustration I heard this week. I liked it. This man said, imagine with me that someone uh, uh, who moved into a home. He, he, he buys a house and it's a used house. <clears throat> and there was another family who lived in it before them. And when you move in, they had moved out, they took all their stuff out, but as you were bringing your stuff in, in the basement, they left this old bowl that was just covered with dirt and grime, and you, you really had no real use for it, but instead of throwing it away, you decided to keep all of your odd nuts and bolts that you have for the house if something breaks and things like that. It just, this is a great place to keep my hardware is in this bowl. And one day, a friend comes over, and he's helping you in the basement, and he looks over at the bowl... And he looks at it real closely and he says, that, that looks like an antique. That could be worth some money. And so you call an antique praiser and he comes over and looks at the bowl and he goes, where did you get this? He goes, well, it was just sitting around the basement when we bought the house. And he says, well, it, it turns out it's an 18th century rare bowl. 
do you have any idea of what it's worth? And the man says, no. He goes, well, in the auction market today, this would be worth $1 million. Does that bowl go back in the basement with nuts and bolts? We laugh because we would say never. That's going to go in the china cabinet protected with cloth or it might even go in the safe. But that, that, all of a sudden there's a new appraisal of this bowl. What happened? Did anything change in the bowl's worth? The difference is your recognition of its value and that has now changed the way you're going to treat that bowl. You missed the intrinsic worth of that bowl, and now you understand. And your wife has this worth. She is a joint heir of the grace of life. The Spirit of God is dwelling within your wife. She's a child of God. Her inheritance is the earth. God gave her to you in a covenant to treasure her, to take your strength physically, emotionally, and your role to use it to live with this woman in an understanding way, to live with this woman that you give honor because of the great value she is to God and what she is to you. And some of you are still treating your wife like a junk bull. And Peter's saying, you need to give honor to this wife of yours. Man, what a beautiful exhortation. This is how we're going to impact the world for Jesus Christ. Our own families when they see this kind of stuff going on in our homes. We live in a day and age where the abuse of women abounds and they're being exploited like never before. And men have been neutered by aggressive feminism. And my prayer is that the Lord would raise up men like this. Amen? Pastor, what if I don't want to do this? What's the big deal? Let's get back to doctrine. I liked Chapter 1, that's good stuff. Well, I just want to close in verse 7 with your crowning incentive this morning, men. He says, for the purpose that your prayers will not be hindered. So men, if we're indifferent to this ex exhortation by Peter and our Lord inspired by the Holy Spirit, if we blame our wife for why we're not doing this, the reason I'm not doing this is because of my wife. Your prayers are going to be hindered. I don't know anything that could break your heart more than that. My communion with God is going to be hindered. My asking of Him for grace to live this Christian life is going to be hindered. The grace that I need from God will be hindered because I'm not showing that grace to my wife. Oh God, give me grace for this while I treat my wife like a, a bowl that holds a bucket of bolts. Give me grace, but I surely don't want to show her any grace, God. Scripture tells us that praying can help you live right. And Peter's saying that living right can help you pray. There's a way to live that keeps your prayers from being clogged then or hindered. And some of you, I've, ha I've heard you testify to, to my face. You feel like your prayers are just hitting the ceiling and they just stop right there. You wake up in the morning and God is so distant and seems unreal. My prayers just kind of feel phony. A sweet, relational, uncluttered, real connection in prayer is as impossible to you as flapping your arms and flying to the moon. Could it be? That your prayer life is hindered all these years because of the way you're treating your wife. Could it be? You can't get any traction in the Christian life because of the way you treat your wife. You've done everything that the church has told you to do and nothing is changing. I want you to ask yourself, how are you treating your wife? And then next week, how are you treating the body of Christ? Could that be why you can't get any traction? Because next, our next section is going to say your prayers are hindered if you won't do the same thing in the body of Christ. So a little lone ranger distant from the body, a little lone ranger distant from your wife, you're going to be distant from God. And that could be the very reason why you can't seem to get past 
the state of struggling and not having a fervent prayer life. Peter wants you to have unhindered prayer, men. So men, are there some changes this morning that he has just brought to light that need to be made at home or the church or the work or the government? How many will stand before God with all of your commentaries and all of your systematic theologies and all of your Greek lexicons and you've missed this exhortation this morning and your prayers are being hindered from a true change and revival because of how you're treating your wife. One of our great theologians, I'm not going to even say his name, one of my favorites who ever lived, his wife died and she got remarried. And she said, I didn't know what it was like to be loved. I now have a new husband and now I know my husband spent all his time in his office writing books and great theologies and philosopher and all of these things, and I never knew what it was like to be loved. I pray that would never be said of any of us in this room. It's not enough that you do not fight. It's not enough that you've kind of learned just how to live together. Men, are you using your strength, physical, emotional, and the role that God has given to you to live in an understanding way and granting her honor as if she's a million-dollar bull now, which is even an underestimate of the value of your bride. And then you may have found why God seems a million miles away and why he doesn't answer your prayers. So what I would like to do now is I want to come to the communion table, and I want you to, to now look at the way a husband treats his bride. And I want us to come and remember the way Jesus lived with his bride in an understanding way. And the way he gave his life for this bride. And that he made us a joint heir with him through this sacrifice that we're now going to remember. And I pray that in that we'll find the power to die to sin and live to righteousness and become these kind of men in our homes. So let's pray, and then we'll partake of the table together. Father, I come before you, and I pray just that. I pray that every eye would look now at the cross of Christ. God, that men who are dying under this exhortation, Lord, the, the ones who now feel so guilty, they just want to crawl out of here, the ones who feel like there's no hope, I pray right now, Lord, lift their eyes to Christ. Let them gaze upon the one who hung on a cross for his bride in their place. God, I pray that all of us would find right now forgiveness for the past. Lord, this cross right now, we're going to remember that though our sins were scarlet, they have been made as white as snow. You'll remember them no more. God, I pray right now that we would find empowerment to become these kind of men in our homes. God, we need you. And our desire is that you would be glorified by saving many souls because of these marriages that will be so contradictory in an age that's falling apart where they've lost the roles and understanding that you designed. Oh God, I pray, put yourself on display by our marriages and save many, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.